As this video is published, the Southern Baptist Convention is the name of the denomination to which I'm referring, but there is an alternative name, Great Commission Baptist, which some churches use and may become the new name overall in the future. In that case, to avoid confusion, I'm letting you know that Great Commission Baptist and Southern Baptist refer to the same Christian denomination. Although I typically don't begin these videos by talking about a church's structure, in the case of the Southern Baptist Convention, there is a bit of information that needs to be understood before even their doctrine can be discussed. In their own terms, the Southern Baptist Convention doesn't have members. Churches choose to support and participate with the SBC, and those churches are considered cooperating SBC churches. Things like membership records, governing policies, selection of leaders, and so forth are handled by the local churches, not the denomination. The SBC is not the Southern Baptist Church, it's the Southern Baptist Convention. All the churches are autonomous. This is relevant because although the SBC sometimes removes a church from cooperative status, effectively kicking them out, the SBC does not try to change the doctrine of local churches or exercise control over them. The SBC constitution states, while independent and sovereign in its own sphere, the convention does not claim and will never attempt to exercise any authority over any other Baptist body, whether church, auxiliary organizations, associations, or convention. Almost all SBC churches are not directly affiliated with the national SBC. There are dozens of state conventions that themselves are autonomous associations of churches. The conventions are free to leave the SBC at will or to align with other Baptist denominations. The conventions all choose how much money they want to forward to the national body. Most of these conventions are state conventions. The Arkansas Baptist State Convention, Baptist Convention of New Mexico, Tennessee Baptist Convention. Some conventions have more than one state, like the Minnesota-Wisconsin Baptist Convention, and some states have more than one effectively competing conventions. In Texas, there is the Baptist General Convention of Texas and the Southern Baptists of Texas Convention. The latter convention formed in 1995 with more conservative churches discontent with the existing state convention. Today, the Baptist General Convention of Texas goes by the name Texas Baptists and allows member churches to designate whether funds they pass along will go to the SBC or other groups, such as the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. A similar situation took place in Virginia. Virginia, leading to two SBC conventions there, one more conservative than the other. Even at a more local level than these state conventions are hundreds of local associations around the U.S. In a nutshell, individuals can't join the SBC, but they can join a church, which is part of a local association, which joined a state convention, which cooperates with the SBC. Now here's why I had to talk about the state conventions before I went further. In this video, some of what I'll be using to describe the beliefs of SBC churches is referring to the Baptist faith and message, which is the statement of faith of the Southern Baptist Convention. However, as the committee report on the submission of the Baptist faith and message 2000 said, no religious authority can oppose a confession of faith on a church or body of churches. Practically, this means that when, for example, the Baptist faith and message was most recently modified in the year 2000 by a committee, the state conventions and the local churches affiliated with them didn't have to affirm it. And in fact, there are several state conventions who haven't. As Dr. Albert Moeller, who was one of the people involved in the revision of the Baptist faith and message 2000 said, the changes made the statement of faith more conservative, and the revision should be considered as the capstone achievement of the conservative resurgence in the SBC. So some less conservative state conventions have stuck to holding on to an earlier version of the statement. One example is the Hawaii Pacific Baptist Convention, which never affirmed the year 2000 revision. Instead, they say that their convention is founded on fellowship based on the Bible and any historic or current version of the Baptist faith and message. State conventions may vary in whether they require member churches to affirm the Baptist faith and message also. However, the national body in the SBC Constitution states that a church can only be in the SBC if they have a faith and practice which closely closely identifies with the convention's adopted statement of faith. This is followed by the statement, by way of example, churches which act to affirm, approve, or endorse homosexual behavior would be deemed not to be in cooperation with the convention. So as I describe the Southern Baptist Convention, and you think all the way down to the local SBC churches near you, realize that the Baptist faith and message isn't an imposition on them, and not every church will align exactly with the current language. And think of this, there are 47,000 SBC churches. That means that even if 95% of the SBC agrees on something, the 
5% that disagree still make up over 2,000 churches. So if your experience with SBC churches is a bit different than what I'm describing, that's not all that surprising. As far as the history of the SBC, how it formed, and some of the splits that it went through, watch the short video Church Splits, Southern Baptist Convention, and American Baptists. On major doctrines of Christianity, the Baptist faith and message affirms one God, all-knowing, holy, and triune as Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Christ is fully God and fully man, virgin born, without sin, and the document affirms his resurrection, ascension, and future return. The SBC doesn't believe in sacraments, but rather ordinances, and there are two baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism is for believers only and not infants and is only by the mode of immersion. The Trinitarian formula is used. According to the Baptist faith and message, participating in the Lord's Supper and being a member of a local church are only to come after baptism. Southern Baptist churches are more likely than churches in many denominations to not recognize baptism from other churches due to various factors. In a 2007 poll of Southern Baptist pastors, Lifeway Research found the following. Only 26% of SBC pastors said that they would not require baptism of new members who were already immersed after conversion in another church that does not believe in eternal security. 13% of SBC pastors would not require baptism from someone immersed after conversion in another church that teaches baptism is necessary for salvation. 3% would not require baptism from someone baptized by sprinkling or pouring after conversion. And only 1% wouldn't require baptism for someone baptized as an infant, whether the mode was sprinkling, pouring, or immersion. The Lord's Supper is viewed as only symbolic with no presence of Christ in the elements. Normally, the elements are unfermented grape juice and unleavened bread. Based on the Baptist faith and message's statement on baptism being only by immersion and communion only for the baptized, you may assume that SBC churches would restrict participation in communion to those baptized by immersion. However, this is just one example of how that statement of faith isn't a strict confession, because that's not the reality on the ground. A 2012 LifeWay research poll of over 1,000 SBC pastors showed the following results in their churches. Only 4% had closed communion, where participation in the Lord's Supper was only for members of that local church. 35% limited communion to those baptized as a believer, and 52% offered the Lord's Supper to anyone who had put their faith in Jesus Christ. 9% allowed anyone who wants to participate to partake or specified no conditions. As for the frequency of communion, only 1% of those polled said weekly, 18% monthly, 15% 5 to 10 times a year, 57% quarterly, and 8% zero to three times a year. On the scripture, the Bible is the 66 book canon, and the Baptist faith and message says that it is written by men divinely inspired, that it has truth without any mixture of error, and is the supreme standard. In the 2014 Pew Research Center Religious Landscape Study, 61% of SBC respondents said that the Bible is the word of God and should be taken literally, 24% said it is the word of God but not everything should be taken literally, and 8% said the Bible is not the word of God. A 2007 LifeWay Research poll of Southern Baptist pastors found that 97% strongly agreed and 2% somewhat agreed with the statement, I believe in the inerrancy of scripture. B&H Publishing, which is owned by Lifeway, which itself is a publishing division of the SBC, released the Holman Christian Standard Bible in its complete form in 2004, later modified and re-released as the Christian Standard Bible in 2017. Lifeway has heavily used the HCSB and now the CSB in much of their materials. However, it can't be said that the CSB is simply a Southern Baptist Bible, as the majority of those involved in the translation were not Southern Baptists. The 2014 Pew Religious Landscape Study found that 12% of SBC respondents believe that humans evolved due to natural processes, 23% say that they evolved due to God's design, and 58% said that humans have always existed in their present form. The Baptist faith and message says that man is the special creation of God, made in his own image. He created them male and female as the crowning work of his creation. Kenneth Keithley, senior professor of theology at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, wrote in 2012 that most Southern Baptists are young earth creationists, and that he wasn't aware of of any Southern Baptist seminary faculty who advance theistic evolution. Keithley himself is an old earth creationist and goes on to say that for most Southern Baptists, including me, the historicity of Adam and Eve is a litmus test. Even a cursory reading of the Bible reveals why we believe this way. The New Testament authors treat Adam as a historical figure and they interconnect the mission and work of Jesus with the first man. Books sold by Lifeway are often heavily critical of evolution. 
The Baptist faith and message affirms humankind was originally innocent, but as the result of the fall now inherits a sinful nature. In the 2014 Pew Research Center Religious Landscape Study, 51% of Southern Baptists said that there are clear standards for what is right and wrong, while 47% said that it depends on the situation. SBC churches teach a one-time salvation experience, conversion, or being born again. The Baptist faith and message says that this new birth is brought about by the Holy Spirit through conviction of sin and that the sinner responds with repentance and faith. Baptism is not part of salvation, but comes after, and salvation is by faith and not works. Although the Baptist faith and message doesn't require a Calvinist view, it does affirm eternal security, that a person can never fall from the state of grace. In a 2012 poll, 66% of SBC pastors said that they did not consider their church a Reformed theology congregation, while 30% agreed with the statement, my church is theologically Reformed or Calvinist. On the other side, the same poll showed that 64% disagreed with the statement, my church is theologically Arminian or Wesleyan, and 30% agreed. 78% of SBC pastors polled said that they are personally not five-point Calvinists, while 16% said they were. 94% of respondents affirmed the statement, a person cannot, after becoming a Christian, reject Christ and lose their salvation. A significant portion of Southern Baptists would reject Calvinism but hold to eternal security, a position recently defined and termed Southern Baptist traditionalism, and upon that term becoming controversial, now sometimes called provisionism. Within the Southern Baptist Convention is a Reformed Baptist, that is Calvinist, group called Founders Ministries, which had 800 churches in 2007. Many well-known Southern Baptists Baptists are Calvinists, such as Vody Bauckham, Mark Dever, Albert Moeller, and Matt Chandler. The Baptist faith and message defines sanctification as an experience beginning in regeneration and doesn't affirm the entire sanctification experience or one-time sanctification event. An FAQ page on the SBC website addresses speaking in tongues and charismatic theology, saying, There is no official SBC position on this issue. If you polled Southern Baptist churches across the nation on the topic of charismatic practices, you would likely find a variety of perspectives. Probably most believe that the gift of tongues, as described in the Bible, ceased upon the completion of the Bible. Some may view speaking in tongues as a spiritual gift given to some Christians, enabling them to communicate the gospel to foreign cultures in a language the speaker had not known previously. A very small minority might accept what is commonly practiced today in some Pentecostal churches as valid. A LifeWay research poll in 2007 found that half of Southern Baptist pastors answered yes to the question, do you believe that the Holy Spirit gives some people the gift of a special language to pray to God privately? Some people refer to this as a private prayer language or the private use of tongues. In May 2015, the Southern Baptist Convention's International Missions Board reversed a policy that automatically rejected missionary candidates who claimed to speak in tongues. In 2017, Calvary Chapel Church Harvest Christian Fellowship, one of the largest American megachurches and pastored by Greg Laurie, announced it would also affiliate with the SBC and is now listed as a Southern Baptist church. Lori, like Calvary Chapel, claims to be charismatic and speaks in tongues, so there is room for charismatics in the SBC today. On last things, or eschatology, the Baptist faith and message affirms a future personal and visible return of Christ and a future judgment and eternal hell. However, there is no statement on millennial or rapture views. A 2009 article from Baptist Press reported on the positions at SBC seminaries. Some of the findings include that among Southwestern School of Theology faculty, 20% are historic premillennialists, meaning premillennial post-tribulation rapture, 15 hold the premillennial and pre-tribulational views, 3 are amillennialists, and 2 abstained. Reports from the other seminaries also included a strong premillennial majority in most cases. Dispensationalism has been popular in the SBC, but at least anecdotal evidence indicates that it is waning. In 2009, Lamar Cooper, president of Criswell College, was asked by Baptist Press the question, do you think that the dispensational view is fading from the SBC landscape? He replied, I believe there are fewer of us, and mostly the older generation that hold to some sort of dispensational view of scripture. Most shy away from it because of the association of the names of Larkin and Schofield. The younger generation does not understand that dispensationalism is not a dirty word in theology. In 2014, Trevin Wax, managing editor of the Gospel Project at Lifeway, wrote on the Gospel Coalition website, Younger Southern Baptists are all over the spectrum when it comes to eschatology. I don't have surveys to back this up, but my hunch is that 30 years ago, most conservative Southern Baptists would have placed themselves firmly in the premillennial pre-tribulation rapture camp regarding end times. Dispensationalism reigned supreme for decades. 
Among young Southern Baptists today, dispensationalism is on the decline and diversity is the norm. Whenever I talk to young guys about their eschatology, they run the spectrum from amillennial to historic premillennial to post-tribulation rapture to partial preterism, but I meet very few traditional dispensationalists. While views on the subject of homosexuality in America have shifted rapidly in the last decade, here's what things look like in the pews of the SBC in 2014. The Pew Religious Landscape Study found that 63% of respondents in the Southern Baptist Convention believe that homosexuality should be discouraged, while 30% said it should be accepted. 71% opposed same-sex marriage and 22% supported it. The Baptist Faith and Message says that marriage is the uniting of one man and one woman in covenant commitment for a lifetime. In June 1980, the SBC annual meeting made a resolution on homosexuality which said in part, Be it resolved that our convention deplores the proliferation of all homosexual practices, unnatural relations of any character, and sexual perversion whenever found in our society, and reaffirm the traditional position of Southern Baptists that all such practices are sin and are condemned by the Word of God. In June 2015, the SBC annual meeting made a resolution on the call to public witness on marriage which said in part, Resolved that Southern Baptists recognize that no governing institution has the authority to negate or usurp God's definition of marriage, and be it further resolved, no matter how the Supreme Court rules, the Southern Baptist Convention reaffirms its unwavering commitment to its doctrinal and public beliefs concerning marriage. On divorce, a 2010 annual meeting resolution says that marriage is a permanent one-flesh union, that even the most expansive view of the biblical exceptions allowing for divorce and remarriage would rule out many, if not most, of the divorces in our churches, and we have been prophetic in confronting assaults in the outside culture on God's design for marriage, while rarely speaking with the same alarm and force to a scandal that has become all too commonplace in our own churches followed by statements calling SBC churches to emphasize the gravity of marriage and commit to ministering to couples in crisis. Individual churches will handle cases of divorce and remarriage differently. The Pew Research Center's Religious Landscape Study found that 66% of SBC respondents said that abortion should be illegal in all or most cases, while 30% said it should be legal in all or most cases. The Baptist Faith and Message says, We should speak on behalf of the unborn and contend for the sanctity of all human life from conception and natural death. Over the years, the SBC has made over 25 resolutions on abortion, including a 2015 statement which affirmed the sanctity of human life from conception to natural death, called Legalized Abortion in the U.S. Genocide, and called for government intervention. Similar statements also oppose physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia. Southern Baptist churches aren't liturgical, and music and worship style can vary significantly by congregation. Some congregations sing exclusively from a hymnal. Others have praise worship or worship teams and a praise band. On alcohol, the SBC has made many resolutions in convention. The 1988 resolution states total opposition to the advertising, manufacturing, distribution, sale, and consumption of alcoholic beverages. Missionaries sent by the SBC's North American Missions Board must affirm, I will abstain from consumption of any alcoholic beverage. Many local churches require or expect total abstinence from alcohol of their staff and often members as well. The Baptist Faith and Message doesn't mention tithing, but it does say that Christians should give regularly, systematically, proportionately, and liberally. However, a 2013 convention resolution stated that Scripture equates failure to tithe with robbing God. Proportional giving of at least a tithe is expected by God throughout Scripture, and that the messengers at that convention exhort all Southern Baptists to tithe cheerfully and give sacrificially. The same resolution said that, according to the Great Commission Task Force report, Southern Baptists give just 2.5% of their annual income to the local church. The Baptist Faith and Message contains a section on religious liberty, which says that the state should not favor any denomination over others, that the church shouldn't resort to civil power to carry on its work, and that the state has no right to impose penalties for religious opinions of any kind. An often heard statement about the SBC is that it only exists for two days each year. Those are the two days of the convention when the messengers from the SBC cooperating churches meet and vote. The big vote is the convention president, who serves for a one-year term. Following a maximum two terms, the president must stand down for at least one term and then is eligible to run again. In reality, the president almost always stops after just two terms. The president appoints the Committee on Committees, which appoints the Committee on Nominations, which recommends trustees for the 11 convention entities and the executive committee. 
the influence of the churches to directly elect the president, who then has the ability to shape the rest of the SBC, means that if the SBC or its entities start conflicting with the churches themselves, those congregations can decide to push the SBC back into line. This is what happened from 1979 through the early 1990s, as the conservative majority of churches in the SBC organized to elect conservative presidents who slowly, through attrition of theologically liberal professors and agency heads, replaced them with conservatives. This would lead to the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship splitting from the SBC in 1990. Local SBC churches send support to their state conventions, which pass along a percentage, varying by state to the national body, called the Cooperative Program. In 2019, 40% of local churches sent no support to the Cooperative Program. There's a lot more detail about the SBC Cooperative Program in my video, Independent Baptist versus the Southern Baptist Convention. The Cooperative Program supports North American and international missions and the SBC seminaries, among other things. At the local church level, churches are entirely autonomous in deciding how to structure their internal polity. Many churches have a single pastor, some have multiple pastors or elders, some have boards of deacons with a measure of authority in church decisions. Most would have congregational votes for the most major of matters, and some have congregational voting for nearly all decisions of importance. Some SBC churches are multi-site with one senior pastor or a pastoral team overseeing multiple congregations. The Baptist faith and message affirms only two offices of the church, those of pastor and deacon. Churches select and ordain their own pastors. In a 1984 resolution, the convention stated that women are not in public worship to assume a role of authority over men, that Paul in the scripture excluded women from pastoral leadership, and that women can serve in all aspects of church life other than pastoral functions and leadership roles entailing ordination. On the SBC Voices blog, John Mark Terry, professor of missions at Mid-America Baptist Theological Seminary in Cordova, Tennessee writes, most SBC churches have only male deacons. Some SBC churches have both male and female deacons. Ultimately, this falls under congregational autonomy. A fact that may become relevant in the future if women in ministry comes to a vote again in the SBC is that the 2011 Faith Matters survey asked Southern Baptists if they thought women should be allowed to be clergy in their house of worship. And over 60% agreed, 46% agreeing strongly. In 2016, the SBC Executive Committee considered joining the National Association of Evangelicals, but in the end decided to recommend that the SBC not do so, saying that the decision to affiliate with a non-Southern Baptist organization is best left to those churches so inclined. For 99 years until 2004, the SBC was part of the Baptist World Alliance, but withdrew that year, naming as a reason for doing so a continual leftward drift in the alliance. The SBC is also not a part of the National Council of Churches or World Council of Churches. As of 2019, there were 47,530 churches in cooperation with the SBC and over 14,500,000 members in SBC-affiliated churches. Weekly attendance was 5,250,000. The Ready to Harvest channel is all about Christian denominations. Please subscribe and give this video a thumbs up if you found it helpful.